Good morning, everyone, and shalom to you all. I want to say shalom aleichem b'shem Yeshua HaMashiach, peace to you in the name of Yeshua, in the name of Jesus, our Messiah. And certainly we all need peace at the moment, don't we? And this world needs peace, and uh, we need peace in the Middle East. And so I want us to hear the Lord's words to us where he says, my peace I give to you, my shalom I give to you, not as the world gives it, but of course he gives us a shalom, a peace that passes all understanding. So why don't you say to the people next to you, shalom alechem, my peace I give to you. Shalom alechem. Beautiful words. Jesus used those words a number of times after he appeared after the resurrection, when he appeared with his disciples, my peace I give to you. So thank you for the opportunity to come and be with you this morning. And yes, you are a beautiful congregation, and it's lovely to be here again and to come and share with you, uh, first of all, a little bit about the work of Celebrate Messiah, and then, of course, to share from the scripture that we had read to us this morning. And so uh, this is difficult times, of course. Uh, we are very heavily involved, of course, with ministry in Israel and amongst Israelis and Jewish people all around the world. And uh, we have uh, colleagues and co-workers, family and friends in Israel, of course, and who are uh, still reeling over the horrific attacks that happened on the 7th of October and, of course, now the war that's in the Middle East, the war that's in Israel and Gaza. And so uh, it's been very difficult times, and uh, of course we pray for uh, Israel. We pray also for a cessation of the, the, uh, the war. We pray that God would spare lives, and it reminds me of the time of Passover. At Passover time, uh, there's a, uh, a story that the rabbis tell that when the Egyptian armies had pursued the Israelites uh, through the Red Sea. Remember how God parted the Red Sea, brought the Israelites through, and then the Egyptian armies pursued and then were drowned in the Red Sea. The story is that the angels began to rejoice in heaven over the, uh, the, the um, destruction of the Egyptian army. And then God rebuked them and said, Why are you rejoicing over the death of a human being made in my image? And so the story is that, and the, the idea is that we should never rejoice over the de death of any human being. And so we mourn over what's happening in, Egypt, uh, sorry, in Israel today. Uh, but uh, I want us to look at this issue of Israel as a nation from a biblical perspective today. And look at what God has promised to the nation of Israel and to us as believers in Jesus, the Messiah of Israel. And so that's the scriptures that I would like to share with you this morning. But first of all, just to tell you a little bit more about the work of Celebrate Messiah that has um, really been growing uh, around the world. I think uh, if you can just move the slide on, I don't have a control of that. So our mission statement, bringing the message to the original messengers remains the same. Our desire is to bring the gospel back to Jewish people from whence the gospel came from in the first place. I think our greatest debt to the Jewish people is that we have received the message of the Messiah through them, and we need to bring the message of the Messiah back to them. And our mission statement has uh, just been adapted a little bit more recently. We've developed it a little bit further, giving all Jewish people the opportunity to hear and to understand and to follow Yeshua, the promised Messiah. And that remains uh, our, uh, our purpose of being. Next uh, slide, I think, is a bit of, our, of all our work around the world. We're now part of a global ministry called Chosen People Global Ministries. And we're working all around uh, the, uh, the world where Jewish people either reside or travel to. So most recent countries that we've added to the network are places like Japan. Now, you might think, how many Jews live in Japan? Well, only about 2,000 or so. But a lot of Jewish people, a lot of Israelis travel from Israel to Japan every year, about 40,000. So there's now a ministry in Japan uh, that uh, hosts Israeli backpackers. This has become a very important ministry around the world. As Israelis travel, we host them and have an opportunity to share the Messiah with them 
uh, uh, as they're traveling. And uh, we have that work also in New Zealand, uh, where there's two lodges that host Israeli backpackers. And also, if you keep on going, we uh, have work in the far east of Russia, in the furthest parts of Russia, right up in the far east and the far north of, uh, uh, northeast of Russia, where Stalin created an area in the 1930s called the Jewish Autonomous Region. The Jewish Autonomous Region, you can look on uh, Google Maps. You'll still find it today. It's very unknown and uh, a very unusual place, but this is where Jews were sent in the 1930s and 40s, and there's still a lot of Jewish people living uh, in the middle of nowhere, just north of China, just east of Siberia, and uh, in the middle of mosquito-infested swamplands. But this is where we began work amongst Jewish people in 2004, and we have a congregation just north of Vladivostok, uh, in a place called Artum. So please pray for the work amongst Jews in the fires of Russia. Next slide is uh, our work in Israel, which, of course, has been very extensive, working amongst Holocaust survivors. Very sadly, some of the Holocaust survivors that we work with in the town of Storot, which was right near Gaza, five of them were murdered in the attack on the 7th of October. Uh, imagine surviving the horrors of the Holocaust in Europe to be killed in Israel. And also children's ministry and uh, other types of ministry, if you keep on going, we have um, a Messianic center in Jerusalem as well as a center in Tel Aviv and a new center in Tel Aviv opening up very soon amongst uh, young Israelis in particular. Keep on going, please. I want to tell you about the Messianic training center. If you want to learn the Bible a little bit more from a Jewish Messianic perspective, uh, we have an online uh, training center. You can actually access our courses Biblical studies, Jewish history, Jewish culture, biblical languages, and uh, it's very affordable. There are courses up there already, and there's new courses that we're rolling out all the time. Also, uh, uh, please pray for us down in the Holy Land of Australia, of course, Caulfield. Uh, there's a large Jewish community there, as you know. The surrounding suburbs around Caulfield, you just go back to the map for a moment, uh, is a special religious area uh, called an Eruv. Uh, there's not just Caulfield, but several of the other suburbs around there, about 45 synagogues and about 75,000 Jewish people. And, of course, um, under a lot of concern and, uh, and pressure at the moment, fear uh, with uh, the increased anti-Semitism around the world is quite uh, alarming. Uh, I mean, no one ever thought it could get to uh, these kind of levels again. And so uh, it is uh, certainly culpable down in Caulfield, people feeling it, people talking about it. Uh, even in our outreach down in Caulfield, we've had to employ a, uh, a security guard. Uh, and of course, just uh, 500 meters around the corner two Friday nights ago, there was uh, a, a Palestinian protest just in Caulfield that resulted in um, the synagogue having to uh, shut down. And people are feeling unsafe just around the corner from us where we live. Uh, there was graffiti on, our, on the walls of a, of a house there. Uh, Jews live here, kill Jews. So, you know, this is Australia, and uh, this is horrific, and uh, we have to make sure we uh, speak up against this, and uh, we should be for love, really, and uh, acceptance of all peoples, for sure. Next uh, slide. Uh, we have the Caulfield Messianic Center in the heart of that. Praise God for this wonderful facility that we can use as an outreach uh, to the Jewish community around us. And we are really grateful to the Lord for that. Next slide. I'm not sure what's next. We have work in uh, Sydney and also work in Canberra uh, as well, if we keep on going. Uh, I think uh, the most important thing I want to tell you about is uh, work amongst uh, hosting Israelis. I think there's a slide there for host Israelis. Well... Can you imagine after this uh, horrific time in Israel as uh, young Israelis want to travel once again around, around the world, um, as they have been? What happens is young Israelis who, who have to go to the army, once they finish with the army, they want to travel, go to all sorts of places around the world. And um, they go to India, as I said, Japan. They go to China. We have work in China reaching out to them. Uh, they go to South America and also New Zealand and Australia. Now, we have started Host Israelis, uh, a ministry here in Australia. If you'd like to ever host young Israelis in your home, please go on to this website, hostisraelis.com.au, and apply to be a host. 
We'll give you information on how to be a good host. We'll give you videos of training you how to share the gospel with Jewish people. And it's a very exciting ministry and, and very powerful ministry. It's what one uh, of our workers described as the sleeping giant of Jewish evangelism. So you can, uh, in beautiful Beaconsfield, I just noticed how beautiful it is here once I drove uh, off the freeway and beautiful hills and trees. So you could also be a blessing to uh, young Israelis as they travel. And there's such an openness to share the gospel with them. Uh, keep on going, please. And um, we have a new venture that uh, you can also find out about. It's called Zula Ru. What's Zula Ru? Not Zulu Ru, but Zula. Zula is a Hebrew word meaning comfortable place. And we want to provide a comfortable hosting place here in Australia and just... Uh, about two weeks ago, we purchased a home down in Apollo Bay uh, to, host is, uh, to host Israelis, and this family have moved down there to be hosts. So uh, this is a brand new venture. We stepped out in faith in the first week, in fact, of the, of the war. We purchased a house, and uh, we hope to be uh, a, a welcoming place for young Israelis as they travel. And so please pray for this uh, new venture, and uh, we now need to pay the bank back. So we would like to pray for your support. Keep on going. Uh, yeah, if you want to sign up to get a newsletter from us, you can either use the QR code that will be on my table at the back, or if you like old, old technology, and this is really better, works much better, uh, fill out your name and address on this uh, clipboard. I have another one on our table. And we have some, new, uh, some uh, calendars we've produced. Uh, it's for the Jewish New Year. It started... In September, of course, this year, we're in the year 5,784. So this is a Jewish calendar, but it also has the normal calendar. And it's, uh, uh, it, it was designed this year for the 75th uh, year of Israel's existence as a modern nation. And it's, it's amazing that uh, this year, uh, the, November, the November prayer page, because it's all about praying for Israel and praying for the Middle East, this one is... Uh, praying for the Israeli Defense Force, which is quite an interesting um, kind of foresight in praying for Israel at this time. All right, let me share with you from the scriptures this morning and the time that I have and uh, talk to you about this subject of Israel being an everlasting nation. We had that scripture read to us. Every time I read that scripture, I'm still very moved by the Lord of, of His promises to the nation of Israel. So let me share with you a secret, but obviously it's not going to be a secret anymore once I share, share it with you. But how can you destroy Israel? Wouldn't our enemies really like to know that? Wouldn't Hamas really like to know how they can destroy Israel, which of course they are intent on doing? Well, the way that you can destroy Israel is first of all, you have to get rid of the sun. Get rid of the sun. Then you need to get rid of the moon and the stars. And then, of course, if you can measure the heavens and explore the depths of the earth, then you can get rid of Israel. Unless you can do that, God's promises to the nation of Israel is that they will always be a nation before him. Now, he's made that promise to no other nation of the world. Australia doesn't have that promise. China doesn't have that promise. No other nation has, has a promise from God that they will be an everlasting nation. Now, I'm sure you also like to lie down on the lawn out on a clear sky at night looking up at the stars. Isn't that an amazing experience if you're in a remote place looking up at the stars and looking up at uh, our Milky Way, our galaxy, now, at any one time, they say that we can look at about 2,500 stars, but of course, there's a lot more than 2,500 stars in the Milky Way. There's apparently something like 400 billion stars in our galaxy. And isn't it wonderful to look up at them? But you know that the scientists also tell us that our galaxy is only one of something like 100 billion galaxies in the universe. So you know what the scientists are trying to tell us? Well, it can't be measured. It can't be measured. And so, since the universe can't be measured and the stars can't be counted, God's covenant with Israel is still intact today. 
Now, this idea of Israel being a chosen nation, I'd like to explore that from a biblical perspective this morning. But first of all, to say that being chosen was not our idea. In fact, being chosen has caused us a lot of pain and a lot of suffering over the centuries, over the millennia. As Tivia the Milkman in the movie or the play Fiddler on the Roof said, God, I know we are the chosen people, but once in a while, can't you just choose somebody else? It's been painful. Think about all the horrific things that have happened to the nation of Israel right from the beginning of our existence with Haman, well, sorry, with Pharaoh trying to rid uh, all the uh, Jewish baby boys from the earth, from Haman at the time of Purim in the book of Esther, from uh, all the other attacks like Hitler trying to kill and wipe out the Jewish people. He managed to wipe out a third of all Jews, six million Jewish people, not that long ago. And so it's caused us a lot of trouble. And a lot of Jewish people are very ambivalent to this idea of being chosen. And the important thing to know is it wasn't our decision. It was God's decision. This is what God says about this in the Scriptures. He says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. A beautiful Hebrew word, segula, a treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And so it was, in fact, God's choice. And he chose Israel not because of anything intrinsically uh, valuable within us, but because of his purpose and his foreknowledge. That's very important for us all to remember because you know, it's the same thing with us as believers in the Messiah. He didn't choose us or choose you because you're someone really very special and, he had, and that we have something intrinsically valuable within ourselves. He chose us because he loves us. And in his predestination and in his foreknowledge, he chose us to be in the Messiah. And we can only just be grateful for his grace that he has extended to us, that he has called us. And so Israel's chosenness is an act of God's grace, as well as our chosenness in Jesus the Messiah. This idea of being chosen has uh, become a very uh, misunderstood term, and also some people and many Christians have now rejected this idea of Israel being a chosen people, saying that that's no longer valid. But if that is true, it makes God to be a liar that God cannot be trusted, that if he makes promises, he cannot keep. We are all chosen as believers in Jesus the Messiah. Yes, we are. But that doesn't negate or uh, abrogate uh, the calling that God has upon the nation of Israel. Otherwise, we cannot trust God. His word cannot be trusted. And yet, he is a trustworthy God. Who believes God keeps his promises? We all believe that. We've been even singing about that today. God keeps his promises to all of us and also his ancient promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So let's explore this a little bit more by seeing how this idea of a chosen nation began with one man. One man. And then he gave this one man a portion of land. And also God has a plan of salvation, and that's good news for us to explore a little bit today. But first of all, this idea of God choosing one man. So we read in Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3, how God chose Avram, or Abraham. He wasn't Abraham yet, he was just Abram. And God chose him. This is what uh, the Word of God says. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. This is what we call the Abrahamic covenant. And God makes different kinds of covenants with uh, people, and uh, two particular types. One is a conditional covenant, a conditional covenant, or bilateral covenant. The other one is an unconditional covenant, or unilateral covenant, a contract that God has made with people. Now, in this particular instance, God makes a conditional covenant with Abraham. That means that Abraham had to do something in order for God's 
promises to be fulfilled. God said to Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to give you descendants. I'm going to use you to be a blessing to the whole world. But what did Abraham have to do? He had to go. If he said, no thanks God, I'm quite happy right here in the Ur of the Chaldeans. I have my wife. I have my slaves. I've got a lot of cattle. I'm quite a you know, wealthy man. I'm not going anywhere. Thank you very much. I'll stay here, but you can still bless me if you want. Well, God wouldn't have blessed Abraham, and this wouldn't have been in effect. But since Abraham did convince his wife, Sarah, and I don't know how he must have done that, because imagine telling your wife, Sarah, we are going to go. We're leaving. She says, where to? I don't know. Why are we going? God told me. She says, what God? You know, they, before that, we know that uh, Abraham's father was a, um, a worship of many gods. So they were said, which God told you? Which one of the idols here ch ch told you that we have to go? And Abraham said, none of them. I can't see the God that told me we have to go. So Sarah would have thought something has gone wrong with her husband. Maybe he'd been drinking too much or he's hearing voices. But somehow she also had the faith. And God moved them on. And because they both went from their own land from their own family, to the land that God would show them. God's covenant was put into effect. And this covenant is a basic covenant, foundational covenant, that still is in existence today. Even Jesus came in fulfillment, actually, of this Abrahamic covenant because he is the seed who is the blessing to all the nations of the earth. So we're all involved in this covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. But then God gave to this one man, Abraham, a portion of land. And we read about this in, in Genesis chapter 15. In Genesis 15. It's a wonderful uh, chapter. Please read it and see how uh, Abraham himself was a sleeping partner to this particular covenant that God makes with him. In this case, God uh, gave Abraham a vision. He was fast asleep and God made a covenant with Abraham and uh, he promised him land, but he also promised him an heir through his wife, Sarah. Because at this point, he was still uh, son, it was without any son, without any child. And Eliezer of the Damascus was going to be his heir, he says. So he complains to God, but God says, don't worry, I will give you a child. And then God says in verse 7, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. Now, this was an unconditional contract between God and Abraham, involving the promise of an heir and the promise of a land. An unconditional contract. In other words, it's not based on Abraham's behavior, not based upon anything that Abraham will do, but simply God took upon himself to make this covenant. It's a covenant of grace. And so the land was given to, uh, to Abraham and his descendants through. Isaac and Jacob, as a gift of grace. Just like our salvation is a gift of grace, that it's not based on our behavior, but our, certainly on God's grace. We don't deserve God's grace, but He has given it to us, and He's given us forgiveness nevertheless through faith in the Messiah. So when we talk about this land of Israel and this land that God promised Abraham, we get much closer to even the current conflict in the Middle East. It is about land, but it is also about religion as well, ideologies. I'll explain perhaps a little bit more later. But let's, let's see how, uh, how this goes with the congregation here. Whose land is the land of Israel? Anyone like to tell me? God's land. <laughs> Wise answer. God's land. You see, God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is the one who has given lands to peoples as he is proportionate as we read in the book of Genesis. And so he in his wisdom gave this land to Abraham. And he is the owner. Abraham and his descendants were only tenants on the land. And we see this all the way through the Old Testament that Israel are tenants on the land. They were to look after the land. They weren't to sell the land. They can't give it away. It doesn't belong to them. It belongs to God. If you rent a house, don't try and sell that house. You'll get into trouble. And the same thing with Israel. They're just tenants on this land. 
And Scripture is full of promises to the people of Israel that God will give them this land to live on. Then in Genesis 15, 1 to 20, we see this unconditional contract between God and Abraham. Now, uh, who thinks that the land of Tasmania is small? Any Tasmanians amongst us? All right, just a few. Well, we all from the mainland think Tasmania is small. So I think I have this map. You know, Australia, uh, Tasmania is really small compared to the mainland. But you know that Israel fits into Tasmania three and a half times. Three and a half times. So Tassie is three and a half times larger than Israel. Very small speck of land. Very small speck of land. Now, God made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but he also made a promise to Ishmael, the son of Hagar. And he said to Hagar, uh, and Ishmael is thought to be the father of the Arabic nations, and he made promises that he would look after him as well. Now, he gave Ishmael land, 672 times the size, 672 times the size of the land of Israel. And they got all the oil as well. We did find some gas off offshore uh, uh, more recently. And so God has looked after Ishmael, but the land of Israel is very small, very small. And then God says in Genesis 15, verse 18 to 21, On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying to your offspring, I give this land. The land from the river Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and the Rephamites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gershosites, and the Jebusites. Now, we are a reasonably multicultural congregation here this morning, so can I ask you, are there anyone, is, there, is there anyone here from the Kenites? Could you put up your hand? Any Kenites this morning? Do you know of any Kenites? Are there any Kenizzites or Cadmonites here this morning? Are there any Raphaites? Any Gershites or Amorites, Canaanites? Are there any parasites? <laughs> no parasites, not in this place. But you see, these were peoples, ancient peoples, but they've all disappeared a long, long time ago. There are none of these people anymore. None of these people anymore. And so, if you think of it as an indigenous Aboriginal land ownership perspective. The Israelites are the oldest people who date back to this time who have had a continuous existence on this land. So just from that perspective alone, it should give us some understanding biblically as to how we should view this issue. Now just to get a little bit more political, which is not really my forte, but just to say something that you're hearing a lot on the news lately about Israel occupying the land of the uh, Palestinians. Which occupation are they talking about? People are not aware of history. They're not aware of who are the most indigenous people on the land and how many times that land has been occupied by so many groups of people. The land of Israel was first occupied by these folks. Just go back uh, to the scripture, rather. The land of Israel was occupied by these folks that you see, these nations that you have there. But they don't exist anymore. The Israelites have had the most continuous and longest history on that land. Then came, of course, the Assyrians in 722 B.C. that invaded the northern kingdom. In 586 B.C., the Babylonians came and conquered Jerusalem and destroyed the first temple. After Israel was occupied by various groups throughout the ages, including the Persians, the Greeks, which we're going to think about uh, when the Feast of Hanukkah comes up next month. The Romans came and occupied at the time of Jesus and even before and after. The Arabs came and kicked the Romans out eventually. The Fatimids, the Siljuk Turks, the Crusaders, the Egyptians occupied the land of Israel as well. The Mamelukes. And then the Ottoman Empire ruled much of the Middle East from 1517 all the way to 1917. What happened in 1917? Well, of course, it was the end of the First World War. And the Anzacs were very heavily involved in liberating the Middle East from the hands of the Ottoman Turks. And the Anzacs and the Light Horsemen helped uh, do that in a, a famous victory. Then came the Balfour Declaration where Britain occupied and had control over 
Palestine. And then the League of Nations, the predecessor to the United Nations, decided to give this land back to the Jewish people after the Holocaust. And so that was first decided, uh, began deciding in 1922, but eventually, of course, this land was given back to Israel, also land given to the Arabic people at that time as well, which they didn't want to accept. And then, of course, in 1948, Israel declared independence. And then there was a war against Israel at that time. Five nations attacked Israel. Uh, they lost that war. Israel remained a nation, but didn't occupy the land that was given to them because, in fact, East Jerusalem, all the way to the west bank of the Jordan River, was illegally occupied by Jordan at that time until Israel eventually took that land in the 1967 Six-Day War. So when people say that we are occupying that land, which occupation are we talking about? How far do you want to go back? And that's what I think people are quite uh, unaware of. And so the land uh, issue in Israel right now is not only a land issue, it's, the issue, it's a religious issue. The truth is that Islam cannot accept a non-Islamic state within its midst. And for that reason, there is always going to be a desire for Israel to be wiped off the face of the earth and to be pushed from the river to the sea as we hear these chants. That is a genocidal chant, by the way. And so uh, I have a different chant, which is, I think, a little bit more biblical uh, from this particular verse. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. So this is a little bit more controversial, but the map that I want to show you next is the map of the land that God originally uh, promised to Abraham. Much larger than Israel today, isn't it? Will we ever get this land? Well, depends on your eschatology. Uh, and uh, I, for one, uh, however it works out, I, for one, believe God keeps his promises. Now, the fact is, when we look at the hist history and we look at the covenants that God made and we look at this from a biblical perspective, it doesn't solve the issues currently in the Middle East. But it does help us as believers in the Bible to have a biblical base to understand what's going on. And all of us should show love and compassion to all people caught up in war and conflict at all times anyway, but in particular in the Middle East as well. We, we mourn and grieve the loss of life. We mourn and grieve the loss of life in Gaza as well. And we call on Israel to be more careful but the burden of blame should be on Hamas, who uses people as human shields. Okay, let's get to the brighter part, and that is the plan. So God chose a man. He gave him a land. The good news is he has a plan. God is in control of this world. We call him the sovereign of the universe. It's not gone chaotic without God. God is fulfilling his plans and purposes, even how difficult it is to understand that. The good news is God has a plan. He's always had a plan, and that's why he chose Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the nation of Israel to bring his message to the whole world through Jesus the Messiah, and he still has a plan for the nation of Israel today. But the plan is for God's blessing of the whole world. So we read a couple of verses in Romans chapter 11. I want to just go to Romans 11 verse 1. Paul asks very important questions in Romans chapter 11. Many questions, in fact, just read the questions and then look at the answers. You know that questions tell us more than answers. I think it was Albert Einstein that said that our education system is the wrong way around. We shouldn't give uh, students questions and ask them for answers. We should give them the answers and then ask them, what were the questions? Questions teach us so much. And Paul asks several of them in Romans 11. In the beginning, in verse 1, he says, Has God rejected his people? Has God rejected his people? There's been lots of answers to this question over the last 2,000 years. And there's a lot of people, even a lot of Christians, and, and the mainstream denominations throughout the ages have said, Yes, God rejected his people, Israel, because they rejected Jesus and God replaced them with a much more obedient people, 
the church. Well, we should have just kept on reading Paul's answer. Has God rejected his people? No way in our kind of uh, vernacular. Uh, by no means. Absolutely not. He says, for I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God hasn't rejected his people. Even though we rejected the Messiah, God had a plan for that. What was the plan? Verse 11. So I ask, did they stumble? That's the Jewish people. Did we stumble in order that we might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, that's when we rejected Jesus, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so to make Israel jealous. You see, there's a plan. God hardened our hearts 2,000 years ago. We didn't accept Jesus as Messiah as a nation. Many, many individuals did, but the nation didn't. That was a plan. That God's message of the gospel would now go to all the nations of the earth. We sang a song this morning about the gospel going forth to everyone. Well, that happened because Israel rejected it as a nation so that salvation message will be preached to the Gentiles. But it was a purpose for that, to make Israel jealous. Did you know that God saved the Gentiles to make Jews jealous? That's the calling of every non-Jewish person who's come to faith in the Messiah all around the world. You've been saved to make Jews jealous. I hope that you're doing that as well as you can. Verse 12. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion be or mean? And so there is great riches for the world when the Jewish people come back to the Messiah. That's why we do the work that we are doing. We do love the world. God so loves the world. We want the world to be blessed. Paul says the way that the world will be blessed is through Israel's salvation. Verse 15, if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? We could do with that right now. Life from the dead, riches for the world, and how, how much that will be when Israel comes to faith in the Messiah. So that's the purpose of ministries like ours, bringing the gospel to Jewish people. And we ask you to pray for us and pray for Israel at this time. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem as we're commanded in Scripture. And uh, stand up and let your voice be heard. We need that right now. I spoke to a Jewish man this week who runs the Anti-Defamation Commission, which is the, anti, uh, the commission set up to combat anti-Semitism. And he says, Christians are silent at the moment. Christian leaders have said nothing. I've had a number of pastors email me, but generally... People are silent. We think that by keeping quiet, we won't be noticed. <clears throat> I did a study this week on Revelation chapter 12. I suggest you read that. The end of the story, this, the, the basic, the, ba the, the end of the story there is that once Satan has gone after Israel, he will turn his attention to those who have the testimony of Jesus. That's Christians. So if we keep quiet right now, let's not forget uh, that our enemy will turn on us as well as believers in Jesus. So we need to just pray. We need to combat all this hate with love. Love conquers all. And we are his disciples. And if we love one another and we love the other out there as well, we can break those chains of hate and bring the gospel of love and grace and peace to all people. But we can do that from a strong biblical perspective uh, and also show love and compassion to all people. So God said, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below be explored, then I will cast off all the spring, offspring of Israel for all they have done, declares the Lord. I'm so grateful for God's grace. How many times do we disobey God or do things he has not asked us to do. How many times do we sin? But praise God that his grace has been given to us uh, and we have been saved by that grace. Praise the Lord for his love for each one of us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you love Jew and Gentile, that you love every nation under heaven. That you so love the world that you gave your one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 
Lord, help us to use all these things in our lives as opportunities to share this good news. Help us to be strong in our faith. Help us to be strong in your word. And Lord, help us to have wisdom in this world that we live in. Keep our eyes on Yeshua, Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. It is all about Jesus, our Messiah. We keep our eyes on you, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be strong and to have hope and to have joy even in these difficult times. For We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Amen.